So I've been using the Mac Studio for the past week now. I've been lucky enough to have access to it, try it out, test it out, see what it's like. And yeah, it's a absolutely absurd machine. So let's get into it. First things first, let's get into the unboxing. The unboxing experience is pretty standard. It matches the packaging we see with the 24 inch iMac and the Pro Display XDR with the minimal design on the outside and the fabric handle. We also get a huge Apple sticker this time and it's in black, very, very pro. Then we get the Mac Studio itself, which is wrapped in this felt like paper material, which feels very nice. And finally, we get the black braided power cable. Really nice to see cables like this as it should be a lot more durable. Other than that, there really isn't anything else in the box. When it comes to the naming of this thing, I think that was actually pretty interesting in the keynote. You know, it seems like they're very much going for like studio vibe, studio setup. So they have the Mac Studio and they also have the Studio Display. It'll be interesting to see if we have any other Apple products that have the studio name. Um, yeah, I'm just really interested to see what they do with that and whether we'll see other future products with that name. When it comes to the specs of the machine that I have here, this has the top of the line M1 Ultra chip with the 20 core CPU and the 64 core GPU. There's also 128 gigabytes of unified memory and a two terabyte SSD. So it's pretty much maxed out other than the SSD. I think a key feature to mention here, other than the M1 Ultra chip, of course, is that it has 128 gigabytes of unified memory. That means it's sharing that memory between the CPU and GPU, which is pretty insane. The cost of this spec is $6,199. So yeah, it definitely isn't cheap, but at the same time, I feel like I'm not even going to justify the price because a person who's looking at this sort of machine and looking to spend that money, to them, spending that sort of money probably won't even be a big deal. They most likely already have a very professional job or they run a business where spending this sort of money really is quite small in the grand scheme of things. So it's definitely not targeted at the average Joe considering the starting price of the M1 Ultra chip with the Mac Studio is $4,000. Definitely not targeted at the average person. It's much more targeted at the working professional. When I was unboxing the machine, one of the first things I noticed was the weight of the thing. It's a very dense package. It has some heft to it. It weighs 3.6 kilograms according to Apple's website. And what's interesting though, is that the M1 Max version is lighter at 2.7 kilograms. So nearly a kilo lighter. The reason for the extra weight in the M1 Ultra version is that it actually has a larger copper thermal module, whereas the M1 Max has an aluminium heatsink. Copper is of course heavier than aluminium, so that explains the weight. Due to the M1 Ultra chip essentially being two M1 Max chips fused together, it makes sense that it would have a better cooling solution, as I'm sure it gets pretty hot under load. Even with the weight though, it's pretty incredible that they were able to fit everything, including the power supply inside it. There is no external power brick. They stuffed a 370 watt power supply inside the Mac Studio, and that's the same regard regardless of if you choose the M1 Max or the M1 Ultra version. Apple won't say exactly how much power it uses under idle, but knowing that at probably max it's using 370 watts or obviously a bit less, that's pretty impressive for a chip this powerful. That also means a lot less heat and also you don't need as big of a cooler, which also means a lot less noise. The design of the Mac Studio is essentially a taller Mac Mini. It's like the Mac Mini's big brother basically. It has a much chunkier look to it and that's due to half of it essentially being taken up by the cooling. It only comes in silver, there is no spray scray option. And on the front, you'll see two USB-C ports, an SD card slot and a status LED. Left and right, there is nothing. And then on the back, you'll find an array of other ports, which we'll get into later. There are perforations on the bottom where the air is sucked in by the cooler, and then it's pushed out the back through more perforations. I actually like the design of it. It's very understated, nothing flashy which I think makes sense as it will most likely sit on a desk. It can easily sit under most monitors and it looks great here with the studio display that I have. The only issue I have with it is that the base isn't very grippy. On my walnut desk, it does slide around pretty easily. This can be quite annoying when you're using the front ports because when inserting something, you inadvertently move the whole thing. Only way I can see to solve this would be to add some third party rubber feet. When compared to my gaming PC though, you can actually see how compact it is. 
And my gaming PC is in a relatively small mini ITX case that has a full size graphics card inside it. When it comes to connectivity, I think most people will actually be happy with the large array of ports that there are available with the Mac Studio. Like I said earlier, on the front you have two USB-C ports, but the speed of them varies depending on the chip you choose. With the M1 Max, they're standard USB-C, which can do up to 10 gigabits per second. But with the M1 Ultra, they are two Thunderbolt 4 ports, which can do up to 40 gigabits per second. There's also the SDXC card slot capable of UHS-2 speeds. And then on the back, we have four more Thunderbolt 4 ports, a 10 gigabit ethernet port, which is very nice to see, two USB-A ports, a HDMI 2.0 port, and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. Honestly, the thing I'm actually most happy about is the front IO. Being able to have quick access to the SD card reader and two USB-C ports without having to fumble around with the back of it, just makes life so much easier. I'm using SD cards every day. I'm using external hard drives every day. You know, I'm shooting content, shooting photos, videos. I'm having projects on external hard drives and stuff. Being able to have those ports at the front just makes my life so much easier. And I'm sure it will make other people's lives a lot easier too. With the array of Thunderbolt ports on offer, you can connect up to four 6K displays and an additional 4K display via HDMI. So for those who want multi-monitor setups, you should be covered. Performance. So as I mentioned, this has the M1 Ultra chip and has everything maxed out other than the SSD. And the star of the show is, of course, that M1 Ultra chip, which is essentially two N1 Max chips fused together. One of the best parts of the M1 chips is the media engine. The M1 Ultra can play a ridiculous 18 streams of 8K ProRes video at once. I'm not sure who's editing a timeline with that many 8K clips, but it's nice to see that the power is there. I'll be honest though, I'm not exactly sure how to make the most of it. I feel like my workflow doesn't really make the most of a chip this powerful, but I've done some stress tests, some benchmarking and stuff like that, um, just to show you how powerful it can actually be. So I have my data here in front of me. I didn't actually do any gaming tests because let's be honest, no one is buying this to do any gaming. So I didn't think it was worth it. And Apple clearly aren't targeting the gaming market either. So if we look at the Geekbench CPU tests, I compared it with the MacBook Air, which has the standard M1 chip in it. And then I also compared it against my MacBook Pro 14 inch, which has the M1 Max chip in it. So we can see the Mac Studio multi-core 24,300. The single core is near enough the same as the others as well. That's to be expected. And then if we look at the OpenCL, the Geekbench OpenCL scores, we can see the Mac Studio coming in with a very high 86,200. Um, I'll be honest, these stats and these figures, I mean, they look cool and stuff, but they don't really mean much, do they? <laughs> I don't actually pay too much attention to figures like that because, yeah, I feel like they're not really real world sort of usage. But yeah, if we actually get into some tests that I did when it comes to editing and, and rendering, things like that. So Final Cut Pro, I had a nine minute video. It was actually in my desk accessories video. Um, 4K footage with an array of video effects, and then it was exported to H.264. MacBook Air did it in 5 minutes 58, MacBook Pro did it in 3 minutes 54, and then the Mac Studio did it in 3 minutes 58. Now, this is interesting, right? Because the Mac Studio is 4 seconds slower. That doesn't make any sense. But this actually happened when I had the MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro chip and I compared it against the M1 Max chip. So I have a feeling it's sort of already optimized. There's no more optimization left with the footage that I shoot, which is Sony A7S III footage, 4K 42 10 bit footage. I think it's sort of at the limit of how much it can be optimized. So yeah, if you're working with files like that, probably isn't worth going with a Mac Studio or even an M1 Max chip. You're most likely gonna be better off with an M1 Pro chip. But then I tried out an 8K project and this is where we start seeing a huge difference. So. I only actually did it on the MacBook Pro and the Mac Studio because I just didn't really think it was worth doing on the MacBook Air and I'll probably be there forever. But anyway, Final Cut Pro, I only did a one minute video, but I had 10 clips of 8K ProRes 42 footage stacked on top of each other. So they're literally sitting on top of each other in the timeline. The MacBook Pro 14 inch did it in eight minutes, 12 seconds, but the Mac Studio did it in three minutes and 35 seconds. So yeah, a big performance jump there. And you know, if you extrapolate this, you have it over a very large project, maybe it's like half an hour or an hour long or two hours long, you can really see the time adding up there. And yeah, it's definitely worth maybe going for the M1 Ultra chip if it's worth saving that time for you. And then next up, we did a Blender render test. So I've been using Blender a lot recently. I've learned how to use it. I've learned how to make stuff in it. And recently Blender have added uh, GPU support. So I am using Blender 3.1 
and I did the BMW render um, in cycles. So the MacBook Air rendered it in six minutes and one second. The MacBook Pro 14 inch did it in one minute and two seconds. But the Mac Studio did it in 33 seconds, which is just mind blowing. Like that is seriously impressive. That's 12 times faster than the standard M1 chip. And that's twice as fast as the M1 Max chip. Again, if you extrapolate that, this is just a small sort of project. This is a small Blender file. Blender renders can be insane sometimes. I've done some Blender renders which have literally taken like all night. I've had to leave my MacBook on all night. Imagine being able to cut your render times in half by moving to the M1 Ultra. I feel like it's just really hard to appreciate how much power there is under this thing until you start using very, very sort of resource intensive apps like that. Like being able to just cut your render times in half, just save hours. Yeah, this has some serious, serious power. So when it comes down to it, this is genuinely an amazing piece of engineering. The most impressive thing to me is how they fit all of this power into such a small package. This sort of thing was usually reserved for big power hungry towers, which produced a lot of noise and produced a lot of heat. The Mac Studio can sit on your desk, no problem. And it does look pretty awesome alongside the studio display. In the week that I've been using it, I've yet to actually hear the fans going and there's no noticeable heat coming out the back. And again, it's also super, super silent. It's just crazy how quiet it is. The main downside I can see though is that there is no modularity. So if you're looking to change SSDs or RAM or anything like that, you can't do that. You, when you buy it, you have to choose it and you're set with it. You can't really do anything like that. Which, yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a disappointment. It would have been nice to be able to change the SSD, upgrade it later on if you want to. But it's clear that Apple are keeping that for the Mac Pro. Um, the Mac Pro, I guess, will be the modular system. It'll be the ones where you can change things out. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they tackle that. But if you don't really need that, if you don't need the modularity, you're happy to stick with it. You can connect external hard drives, 128 or 64 gigabytes of unified memory is good enough for you. Then yeah, well, like, this will be good enough. For me personally, I'll be sticking with my 14 inch MacBook Pro. And the main reason why I'm sticking with the MacBook Pro is for portability. I'm going different places. I'm going between home and the office. I need a portable machine. But if I weren't doing that, I didn't need the portability, I would 100% be going with a Mac Studio. What I am very interested in though, is how Apple are going to be tackling the Mac Pro, because I can only assume the Mac Pro is going to be a modular system. It's gotta be, right? But the chips that we have in here aren't going to be in the Mac Pro. As far as I can tell, they're gonna have a different chip, maybe M2 chip, or maybe sort of like a, a sideline, like a sidestep from the M1 chip. Who knows? Who knows what they're going to do? But I'm pretty sure it's going to be a modular system. But anyway, that's for the future. We'll see what happens. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. For those who got to the end of the video, please leave a comment with the words Mac Studio in the comment. It's nice to see who got to the end of the end of the end of the video. <laughs> Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter and subscribe for more.